Good morning. It's good to be together. Uh, just a few days away from Thanksgiving. Hopefully you know that. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving. I know it will be a little bit different. I had a friend walk in here to service today and say, you know, I'm just kind of disappointed. I was supposed to go to North Carolina for Thanksgiving. I don't get to go there now. So now Thanksgiving is going to look a little bit different. Well, that fits for 2020 because everything looks a little bit different uh, this year. But uh, Thanksgiving is, uh, is intended to be a time where we give thanks. Uh, but we have turned it into a time where we stuff our, stuff our bellies and uh, hang out with family and friends, which I'm not complaining about that at all. And so I know that your Thanksgiving look, may look different. My Thanksgiving is going to look different. Literally every Thanksgiving my entire life for 40 years, I've been with the Scott side of my family. And uh, my grandmother cooked a phenomenal Thanksgiving dinner, and then she passed uh, several years ago. But uh, my aunt, my dad's sister, cooks exactly like my grandma Scott did. So literally every Thanksgiving my entire life, I've had the same turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, corn, chocolate pie. Addie, I just realized chocolate pie, Aunt Sherry's chocolate pie. Now I'm depressed. Um, it, it's, just, it's just whatever it is going to be. It's, it's a time of Thanksgiving. In, in light of that, I think in a very, very difficult situation, it is important to not just be grateful, but also to celebrate things that God is doing amongst his people. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but, but uh, if you're with us, you're with us online, you're here with us in person, uh, you are blessed to be a part of a phenomenal church, a phenomenal church. And uh, yeah, you can celebrate that. Um, it, here's what we're going to celebrate, though. Check this out. I want to show you a picture. This is, this is a phenomenal church. Now, when you look at this, you're like, oh, that's cool. That's kind of a decent amount of food. No, that is 130 baskets of food, each basket representing a meal, a Thanksgiving meal for a family here in Central Ohio. So some of y'all know that every Thanksgiving we partner with the Columbus Dream Center downtown, and we provide literally their entire Thanksgiving meal. Well, due to COVID, they're not having that Thanksgiving meal, but here's what I love about them. They didn't make that as an excuse. They just found a different way to be a blessing. And so they contacted our church and they said, hey, what would you guys think about literally donating uh, individual family Thanksgiving meals? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you a list, and then you just go to like Walmart or something like that and pick up a, uh, hopefully a new um, laundry basket, put all the, the, the uh, at whatever, the eateries and all these different de- type of items in for Thanksgiving, and then we're going to donate those. So we had a goal. We said, yeah, we can do that. We'll do 100 of these bad boys. 100, 100 uh, different meals, we'll, we'll do it. 100 different family sponsored. Well, here's 130. So you guys went 30 over. So literally this Thursday, we're going to be able to bless 130 different families with a Thanksgiving meal. Phenomenal. So what you guys brought in is they had a list, but I started looking at this picture and I'm like, man, there's some interesting things on this. Everybody kind of has their favorite Thanksgiving dish. So let's take turkey off the table. That's kind of a staple. But what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Well, right here, this is what I noticed. In the very far corner, you got a bag of marshmallows. What's that for? A little sweet potato with a little marshmallow casserole on it. You got the stovetop t- stuffing, which is good, but I like the stuffing that actually comes out of the bird. But uh, there's some interesting things in, in this picture that I want to point out. You got two things of Pringles. Who eats Pringles on Thanksgiving? Uh, I don't know if that's for green bean casserole or whatever. You got some multi-grain Cheerios. Uh, so that, this is a staple to Thanksgiving because you got to warm that thing up a little bit with a little bit of breakfast so you can eat a big Thanksgiving. But they got frosted flakes back here. But I just want to say this is awesome. 130 families will be blessed this week as a result of Worthington Christian Church. Awesome, awesome stuff. Even more than that, I'm going to share something with you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife and I are just hanging out at home on a Sunday night, and she has a contact here in the Worthington area that uh, a few years ago it just decided to start a nonprofit that blesses families in need at Christmas time. And so my wife's sitting there texting with this person, and uh, we always adopt a few families. So our small group, the life group that my wife and I are a part of, we've always adopted, you know, I don't know, 10 families or something like that. And so Addie's talking with this lady over text, and she said, hey, how many families? do you think that you all could take this year? And Addie said, well, I know this is a unique year. How many families do you need us to take? And they're like, I don't, as many as you can. And so I think Addie said something like, okay, we'll take 50. And then we'll just put it out to the church. We'll take 50 families. Well, as of, I think, yesterday, there was 107 people that responded, not to a church-wide announcement, to one person texting another person, another person. I mean, this is all through a text stream. I got people showing up on my front door every day with big baskets of presents say, hey, here's Addie's, Addie's uh, uh, Christmas presents for all. 107 families already that are being sponsored in Worthington, families in need. 
kids that need shoes and coats and uh, soccer outfits or whatever. So we're going to go and we're going to pick out the best soccer outfit that we can pick. Adidas pants, Adidas. I think the kids are still in Adidas. I'm kind of old like that. But, you know, all this and just a huge blessing. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Whatever takes place, whatever happens in 2020 or even in the beginning of 21, we have been blessed to be a blessing. We simply call it this, follow Jesus together. The most important decision that somebody can make on this side of eternity is the decision to follow Jesus, to accept God's free gift of grace that comes through Jesus. God literally says to us, here's my son. I know that you will fall short of my standard. That is my foreknowledge. God says, that is my foreknowledge. Here is my son. His perfection will cover your sin. But here's the caveat. You have to accept a gift in order for a gift to be a gift. And so we just simply have to accept that. I say, okay, Lord, I believe in your sacrifice. I believe in Jesus. I welcome that grace into my life, and I live both now and forever in relationship with the Almighty God, not because of what I've done, but because of what God has done for me through faith in Jesus. You know, I find this phenomenal passage of Scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. If you ever struggle to know what to do, I, I, just, I encourage you to find yourself in the book of Proverbs. In the Old Testament, King Solomon, who we're going to talk about a little bit next week, who is David's son, he writes many Proverbs, wisdom Proverbs in the Old Testament. Proverbs 27, 17 simply says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Have you ever been around someone who, who sharpens your blade? It's pretty encouraging, isn't it? You know, maybe that's the problem with Thanksgiving. You, 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 were, you were planning on getting with, with people that sharpen your blade, that encourage you, that lift you up, that give you a place of, of safe restoration. But have you ever been around someone who dulls your blade? It's pretty exhausting, isn't it? Encouraging for those that sharpen, exhausting for those that dull. What's well, a choice? We have a choice to either be with people and sharpen their blade or be around people and dull their blade. It's literally a choice. And we all sometimes make the choice to dull one another's blade. A lot, of the, a lot of this comes in form of opinion or just, you know, just what my friend calls just literally uh, throwing up on somebody all the problems that you have in this world. It's a choice to be an encourager as iron sharpens iron. Well, today we're going to start to really, really conclude our series uh, of what we call a series of unfortunate events. It's really our study of First and Second Samuel, study of one of the most important people in all of God's story, King David. You have a Bible with you this morning? Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And as we move into 2 Samuel 24, we've got to be reminded of all that we've, we've studied from First and Second Samuel. You remember the first person that we met in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel? This woman named Hannah. And Hannah went to the house of God. Hannah was a barren woman. And she went to the house of God and she begged God through prayer to bless her with a child. Hannah becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a boy who, who she names Samuel, first and second Samuel. And so Hannah weans Samuel, the young child Samuel weans him, takes him back to the house of God, dedicates him to God, and then he's raised by this guy named Eli the priest. Well, Samuel grows up, and you've got to remember the book of 1 Samuel comes right after the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Uh, judges are, are there in the historical period where it comes through that. So Samuel actually becomes the de facto leader of Israel. The people of Israel go to Samuel and they say, Samuel, we want to be like everybody else. We want to be a, like all the other nations that are around us. Would you please anoint for us a king? Which really discourages Samuel. They dull Samuel's blade. Samuel goes to God and he says, God, I don't understand why they want me to do this. And God says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their leader. Just give them what they want. But tell them, that king's going to take the best of yours. He's going to take the, your young men, take them off to war. He's going to tax you. He's going to take you, you know, your daughters, your sons, all these things. So he does. They said, yeah, yeah, we're good with that. Yeah, we're, we're totally good with that. Give us a king. And that guy becomes known as King what? King Saul, the first king of Israel. How is Saul selected as king? He's selected as king because he's the tallest and best looking man among all the Israelites. Probably not the best thing to qualify someone as king, right? As we've shared, you can say whatever you want about the 2020 presidential election. It was not an election for the best looking man in America, right? Somebody just said amen. 
And this is how Saul becomes king. Well, his looks don't get him very far. He begins to disobey God, and then God searches for a man after God's own heart. That becomes who? David. David, one day, is, uh, he's one of eight. He's the, he's the youngest son of eight, the sons of Jesse. And so David's brothers are off at war. They're fighting for the Israelite army, and they are fighting against the Philistines. And David's uh, father, Jesse, says, I want you to go take provisions to your brothers on the front line. David shows up as the youngest, and he gives these provisions, and there's this big oaf that comes out of the Philistine battle line every day yelling at the Israelite army. This big oaf's name is, anybody guess, Goliath. And David says to the guys, he said, why don't somebody just go out and kill this big oaf? Why do you let him taunt? And they said, well, if you want a shot at him, go, go ahead. And he said, okay. He takes his sling, he picks up a few rocks from the stream, he goes out there and he fires this rock from his sling, it hits Goliath straight in the forehead, literally embeds into his forehead, and this big giant, oh, he falls hard. And then David does one of the coolest things in all the Bible. He goes over to Goliath as Goliath is knocked out cold. He takes Goliath's own sword, cuts his head off, and he says, game over. And the Philistines just take off running. David becomes legendary. Legendary. It's not long before David become, becomes king, and it seems like everything David touches turns to gold. Until 2 Samuel chapter 11, when David finds himself to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong woman. See, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says this in 12. It says that at a time when, David, when kings go off to war, David decided to stay back and do a little sightseeing. It's a sin that David pays for time and time again. Rebellion starts in David's own household. Years to come, his son Absalom rebels against him. They have to squash that rebellion. David actually leaves Jerusalem. After the, the rebellion of Absalom is crushed, another knucklehead named Sheba decides that he wants to overthrow David. They have to squash that rebellion. I mean, it's time, it seems like this is it's ebb and flow ever since 2 Samuel chapter 11 to the end of the book of both good and bad that happens in the house of David. And today we find ourselves really in the second to last event of David's life. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Let, let's take a look at it. Verse 1, it says this. It says, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Huh. God is angry with Israel for some reason. And he incited David against them, saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. And so the king said to Joab and the army commanders with them, he says this, he says, go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many men, fighting men, there are. 2 Samuel chapter 24. A couple questions I have here as we begin is first is, why is God angry? Here's where it becomes difficult. We're, we're never told why God is angry with Israel. We, we can take a couple guesses, but, but here's my even, my bigger question is the second question. Who incites David against Israel and incites David to take this census? Now, if you look at the verse, it, it, it seems to be very clear. God's anger rose up against Israel, therefore he incited David to take a census of the fighting men of Israel. So who is he referring to? God. But here's where it gets really, really dicey. You have the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. Right after that, you have the books of 1 and 2 Kings, where Solomon becomes king. And then there's this long list of crazy kings after Solomon. And then you get into the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles. Well, in 1 Chronicles 21, it records the same exact event when David counts the mighty men, when he counts these fighting men right after he lists his mighty men in 2 Samuel 23. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it literally says this, Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to count the fighting men. So who caused David to count the fighting men? Was it God? which seems to imply 2 Samuel 24, or was it Satan, which 1 Chronicles 21 implies? Here's where I have to admit to you, I have no idea. I've studied, I've read through this, and I cannot get a clear answer. But I do know this, why is God angry with the Israelite people? For the same reason he was angry with them at the very beginning of 1 Samuel when they asked for a king, because they lack faith in God that God is a good enough God to lead them. What does David do here? He basically looks back on his life and says, well, let, let, let's count the men. Let's just see how powerful I have become. That's a lack of faith, isn't it? I mean, if you have faith that God is going to provide, you're probably not going to go out back and count chickens one by one, right? That's not really a move of faith. So in verse 3, we see this. 
goes on to say, but Joab replied to the king, to King David, may the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over. And may the eyes of my Lord the king, even though he's old, may he even see it. But why does the Lord the king want to do such a thing? What is Joab telling David? It's a bad idea. Why would you want to do this? We're at a time of peace. Don't go count and enroll all the fighting men. Here's a quick lesson in this. When we're faced with really, really difficult decisions, and we're in a room filled with very qualified leaders, if we're the only one that thinks we have the right answer, that should at least bring us caution. I'm not saying we're wrong, but that should at least bring us caution. If we are the only one in the room who thinks that we have a right answer to the situation when we are among qualified leaders, which Joab is, Joab's been with David since the very beginning, it's probably a caution that there is a potential for something really bad to happen. We said it last week, you may be exceptional, but you're not the exception. I may be exceptional, but I'm not the exception. We say, we say it this way around our church, teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. Do not fly solo, especially when it comes to big decisions. Well, David decides to, fall sl- to, to go solo, and it does not turn out well for him. For some reason, David forgets how he has become king. David's a talented young, uh, talented young man at one time, and now he's even a talented old man at this time. You know, there's a quote that I love that is often attributed to C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors. But there's some discrepancy around whether C.S. Lewis wrote this or not. So let me just give you the quote, and maybe you can do the research to find out who officially said this. But I'm telling you, as soon as you Google this quote, it will say that C.S. Lewis wrote this, but there's no identification that he actually did. Here's the quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. What did Jesus do? That's exactly what he did. What does David need to do in this time? He needs to think less of himself. But I guess in his own old age, he has a moment where he just kind of lacks wisdom and he says, Let, let's just see all that I've accomplished. Let's go and count all the men that I, that I have at my disposal. So that's exactly what Joab and the army commanders do. And they count 800,000 fighting men in Israel with an additional 500,000 fighting men in Judah. Do the math real quick. That's 1.3 million fighting men at David's disposal in a country that is far less geographically distanced than the United States of America. That's a lot of fighting men. And he just mentioned in 2 Samuel 23, his warriors, his mighty men. As soon as that's reported to David, This happens in verse 10. David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. Uh Uh-oh, he's starting to feel guilty here. And he said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. Why? Because he went out on his own. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Why is it foolish? I don't know exactly, but I, I do know that God has a problem with it. Look at verse 11. It says, before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad the prophet, David's seer, a prophet that serves David, uh, uh, an advisor to King David. Verse 12, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Never good to hear that. I mean, we got kids in the service or kids with us online. When your parents go to you and say, hey, I'm giving you three options, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, what did I do wrong? Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. Continues to go on. So Gad went to David and said to him, shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land? Well, that's not going to be a good thing. Or three, three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you. Has David done that a time or two in First and Second Samuel? He, he, he fled from, from King Saul in 1 Samuel twice. He fled from his son Absalom once and had to hit in, he hid in caves all three times. And then he had to overthrow a, a potential rebellion with Sheba. David's already done. He's already fled from his enemies. And then here you go. Here's the third option. Or three days of plague in your land. Gad says this. Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. And so Gad the prophet leaves. I don't know about you, but if I'm David... I would simply say, Gad, Gad, hey, Gad the prophet, my, my advisor, can you do me a favor? Do me a solid real quick. Could you go back to God and ask if there's a less intense fourth option? 
I mean, think about this. You want a famine? You want to flee from your enemies? Or do you want a plague? Well, David immediately takes the fleeing from his enemies off the table. He said, no, I've been there, I've done that. I don't want to fall into the hands of man. He said, so God, do as you see fit. If you think a famine would teach us to follow you better, bring the famine. If you think a plague would teach us to follow you better, bring the plague. I submit myself to you is what David says. God allows a plague to come over them. And in just two days, 70,000 of David's fighting men die because of this plague. In verse 16, we read this. It says, when the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity. Why? Because God is a compassionate God. And said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough, enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Now here's my question here. What is a threshing floor? How many of you, by show of hands, either online, you can comment in the chat thread, or here in person, how many, how many of you are farmers? If you're a farmer, a legit farmer, raise your hand. I didn't think so. <laughs> I didn't think, we're not farmers. We, we live in either urban or suburban areas. We're in the suburbs. So what's a threshing floor? A threshing floor is huge in the word of God. Because a threshing floor is where a farmer takes his crop and separates the grain from the chaff. The grain is separated at, the, at the, uh, the threshing floor. That grain is taken, and you'll remember this in the parables of Jesus in the gospel, that grain is stored away in barns to be used by the farmer to feed his animals, to feed his own family. And then the chaff, the leftover that is worthless, lays on the threshing floor. It is either burned on the spot or it's swept aside and then burned. You see, the image of a threshing floor is used by God over and over and over from Genesis, really almost to, to Revelation. Even Jesus will talk about a threshing floor. And a threshing floor is this, the place in which God separates good from evil. So after two days, God says to the angel, hey, enough, enough. And the plague stops. God says to David, David, you are to go to this place, this guy Aruna, to his threshing floor, and you are to build an altar of sacrifice, and you are to send up sacrifices to me for the forgiveness of, the, of your sin and the sin of the people. In this altar, this threshing floor, Aruna's threshing floor, is actually located at a place called Mount Moriah. Now, if you've read through the Old Testament, this may make a little bit of a sense. Mount Moriah is a huge historical place for the Jewish people. First and foremost, it shows up in my memory where Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. So Abraham takes his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah, and God literally has asked him to do this crazy thing. And right before he sacrifices Isaac, God provides a ram in the thicket. And Abraham sacrifices the ram instead of his son, which is a good thing. But it's a very, very clear prelude to the gospel to God having to sacrifice his own son for the forgiveness of our sin. Second, on Mount Moriah, David has to build this altar for the forgiveness of sin for the people to remove the plague. Third, in 1 Kings chapter 8, literally in eight chapters after this, Solomon, David's son, King Solomon, is going to build the temple of the Lord on Mount Moriah. Even more than that, a thousand years removed from this event, a guy by the name of Jesus is gonna, gonna claim to be the son of the almighty God and therefore they're gonna crucify him at a place that is really right next to Mount Moriah. Even more than that, in Acts chapter one, Jesus, after his resurrection and after he appears to over 500 people of his followers in a period of 40 days, is going to ascend back to heaven at a place, literally a traditional site that is a quarter mile from Mount Moriah. What's the point? God will show in his word from Genesis to Revelation time and time again that he's willing to do almost anything possible for us to be forgiven, for us to be restored and redeemed into a right relationship with the almighty God. With the exception of Jesus, David is the most talented man that I read about in the scriptures. If David can't do it, no one can do it. I know I fall short. I know I fall into the category of Romans chapter three, where Paul writes, for all fall short of the glory of God and all are in need of redemption. And that comes through the blood of Jesus. Even the greatest person born of woman, 
That's what Jesus said about John the Baptist. A pretty huge compliment. Even John the Baptist says this. Matthew chapter 3, into the New Testament, Matthew 3, 11, it says this. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not even fit to carry. You talk about humility. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Look at this. I can't even believe this is in the New Testament. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear what? Jesus will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, his people into the barn, known as heaven, and burning up the chaff with what? Unquenchable fire. This is Jesus talking about the difference between heaven and hell. And what does Jesus say? I will die for you so that you can experience the forever presence of the Almighty God. That's heaven. The very definition of heaven is this, the forever presence of God. The very definition of hell is this, the forever absence of God. And Jesus says, I will literally stand in your place and be the ultimate sacrifice of sin. But here's the thing, you got a choice. You can either choose to walk with me now so that you can walk with me forever, or you can choose to deny me now, and guess what? There are consequences to nine. You don't want to walk with me now, you're not going to walk with me then. You want to walk with me now, then you can walk with me then. It's simple. It really is simple. God's willing to do anything for us to come into a right and restored relationship with him. And it is all over the pages of his eternal word that we call the Bible, even in the Old Testament. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you extend your grace to us over and over and over again. Lord, we see in the most talented people that, have ever, that ever arrive in your story, Somebody as talented as David still can't do it on his own. He needs your grace. He simply falls into your hands of mercy. And Lord, as we look about, about that, whatever our situation is, whatever our life is, whatever our journey is, may we fall simply into the gracious hands of the Almighty God. And that comes through faith in the permanent, eternal, atoning sacrifice of your Son. And even more, the resurrection of your Son so that we may have life and life to the full. Lord, may your spirit work in a place that leads us into that time. And Lord, we thank you so much for the celebration of those who give their life to you. And as we'll see as, can, as service concludes today, somebody deciding to follow you and being baptized into you. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.